All right, good evening. Good evening. All right, welcome, welcome. Appreciate y'all for coming through tonight to our Malcolm X talk on When Baltimore Awakes, an analysis of the human social service sector here in Baltimore. Uh, if you are unfamiliar, my name is Adam Jackson. I'm the Chief Executive Officer of Leaders of a Beautiful Struggle, a grassroots think tank located here in Baltimore. Uh, if you're familiar with LBS, uh, we do political advocacy and the public policy interests of black people here in Baltimore City. Uh, founded in 2010. Uh, actually, next year will be our 10-year anniversary come next August. So we've been around 10 years almost. So a brief explanation uh, before I get into what's going to happen uh, tonight. I just want to explain something real quick. Uh, if you already have a copy of our paper, appreciate you for getting it. The reason why we ask for donations for the paper is because uh, they cost money to print. We want to make sure we give them out to the community for free, uh, but they cost money, like the real kind of money, like 75 pages in full color kind of money. So if you want to donate, that'd be awesome, besides what you're buying them tonight. Uh, also, you can become a sustainer for Leaders of a Beautiful Struggle. Uh, that means that you give money on a monthly basis to sustain our organization. Uh, part of our point, even in this paper, is figuring out how to make uh, black institutions more viable uh, without depending on the uh, white, white institutions to do that for us in the form of grants and other things. And so LBS, one of the things we pride ourselves on is that our sustainers, people in community who give monthly, are the people who are the lifeblood of our organization that make sure we can cover all the necessary expenses to go to Annapolis, to do political advocacy, and all the other work that we do here in Baltimore. Uh, so if you want to sign up to be a sustainer, you can see myself or Candace over here at the table tonight. And uh, please support LBS, because we do a lot of political work, and your direct support uh, supports us, like PBS. Viewers like you support LBS. It's kind of vibe. Uh, so, uh, so in terms of tonight, uh, so tonight uh, we're going to be talking about the paper when Baltimore awakes. Uh, so we intentionally called it a black paper because you know most you know nonprofits or uh, you know think tanks produce white papers, and white papers give you information. Uh, but the purpose of a black paper, the reason why we called it a black paper, is because the purpose is to use it as a weapon, as a spear, to go into the nonprofit and philanthropic sector to advocate for our community and to have the arguments, analysis, research to do so. And so this is not just something we decided to do because we thought it was a thing to do. You know, we've been making this argument uh, since we've been around, uh, since our beginning. And so we thought it was just essential uh, that we have a comprehensive document that explained our position and to give other people and other, other organizations, other institutions, the power to actually transform those institutions or to make our own institutions and to build for self. So, uh, so I'm going to stop talking. I'm going to invite Davon Love, the author of the paper. And the way it's going to happen tonight is that we're going to have a few minutes of uh, Davon talking about the paper, and afterwards we'll have a Q&A. So it'll be more discussion-based tonight. But I'll, bring, I'll welcome up Davon, our director of uh, public policy, to get us started. All right. Um, so good evening. As Adam mentioned, my name is Davon Love, director of public policy, leaders of a beautiful struggle. Um, I'm actually really excited to address you all today this um, piece that we wrote. Uh, as Adam mentioned, this is a, an argument we've been making since our existence. And a part of why we have been so insistent on challenging um, the nonprofit sector, the human social service sector, um, is because our training kind of dictated to us um, that's important that in movement building, um, to listen to what people in the community want and need. And so as we began to just volunteer and just do work in the community that wasn't necessarily political, but just building relationships, one of the themes that was a recurring theme was the fact that not only were there not enough resources for folks to do the work they want to do, um, but that oftentimes there were folks outside of our communities dictating what it is that we need to do. Um, and so that was a really recurring theme of the conversations that I've been having with folks, particularly elders, many of which who've been pushed out of the human social service sector because of their attempts to actually do right by our community. And so we kind of dedicated intellectual energy into figuring out how to produce an argument um, and a comprehensive set of information and research such that people had the tools they need to articulate this dynamic in a way that would allow folks, as Adam mentioned, um, to weaponize it in service of our community. So, um, so what I want to do, I'm going to just um, talk generally about the context of the paper. I'm going to talk about some of the sections in the paper. 
And as Adam mentioned, I mostly just want to engage you all. I'm actually really interested to hear people's feedback, people's thoughts, um, you know, points of disagreement, um, and also just other general thoughts that people have about what we produced. So I'm really looking forward to that. Um, all right. The human social service sector tracks billions of dollars in the hands of professionals um, who are credentialed by institutions that are not other from our community. So many of the major institutions that are tasked with socializing youth and tasked with providing services to black people, um, the professional credentials involved in um, putting someone in a position of authority um, is based in institutions that they themselves have a fundamental disregard for the humanity of black people, right? So whether, but have not versed themselves in the history and culture of our communities and neighborhoods. And so not only is that a problem in terms of the perspective, but as I mentioned, billions of dollars are tracked into the human social service sector. So not only are people who are under any reasonable criteria not qualified to lead our community put in positions to do so, but there are billions of dollars that buttress their ability to institutionalize their influence. And so as I mentioned earlier about listening to the things that folks were saying in the community were general challenges that people had in terms of doing work in the community, it was the lack of resources, but also having to contend with people who are empowered by this society as leaders, as exemplars, as professionals, to have to struggle against them to do the work that folks know is important to do in the community. Um, and so we've been making this, we, we kind of started off with the critique of the nonprofit industrial complex. And so, you know, and, and just as a, as a general critique of the political economy of the nonprofit sector. In a democratic dominated state, um, Democratic Party dominated city where everyone's supposed to be liberals, one of the questions we had is why is it that Baltimore still has many of the same problems that you see um, in Republican districts and jurisdictions? And so we kind of came across this idea of the nonprofit industrial complex as a way to help to answer that question, right? That there was a certain way in which liberals and so-called progressives were themselves perpetuating racism and white supremacy um, while at the same time professing to be our allies and professing to be people who are sympathetic. Um, and it's actually a very difficult moral position to take in certain public spaces um, because those who are understood to be trying to help us um, <laughs> those who, um, who profess to try to help us um, in the sympathy that arises from um, that impulse oftentimes allows people to, to position themselves um, as people who authentically care about our community and makes it put you in a really bad position in terms of having to explain why a person who really wants to help is actually doing more harm than good. Um, so that's just the kind of general context. So we wanted to write something that gave people the tools necessary that in that context, they would have the weaponry necessary to partici participate in that conversation from a position of strength and having the intellectual backing necessary um, to navigate those dynamics. All right, so why use the title When Baltimore Wakes? So it's actually a play off of Hubert Henry Harrison's 1920, When Africa Awakes. So Hubert Henry Harrison was a prominent scholar in the New Negro Movement. Um, he actually was a contemporary of Marcus Garvey. Um, J.A. Rogers referred to him as the Black Socrates. Um, he was a prolific scholar in, in the tradition of Pan-Africanism. And When Africa Awakes was actually his critique of the labor and socialist movement. So at the time, the Communist Party, Socialist Movement, the Labor Movement saw the issue facing black people as a way to buttress their global political interests and ideology. And so folks like Garvey and Hubert Henry Harrison were militating against the attempt to essentially use black suffering to operationalize their intellectual and political enterprise. And so when Africa Awakes, it was a criticism in 1920 of the way in which white liberals were attempting um, to use black suffering as fertile ground for exploitation. And so similarly, here in Baltimore, um, as I mentioned earlier, in a place where supposedly dominated by liberals and progressives, 
um, wanted to put forward a piece that essentially explains the problem with the way that black suffering is, um, the way that black suffering um, is used and operationalized. And actually start in the beginning, and it was a very impactful quote because it explains something I mentioned in the beginning of the paper. Um, Hubert Harry Harrison's other work, Negro on the Nation, um, when he describes the shift from chattel slavery to, um, to after emancipation was a shift in slavery being maintained by brute force and after enslavement being changed to, to slavery by starvation. And so the plantation metaphor for me is really important because the human social service sector serves as an appendage of that plantation, um, as, 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 the, as the political economy of the plantation. So the use of starvation. I've had lots of conversations with people in the human social service sector who have said some version of, I would want to do this, but I will get fired if I do it. Right. And so that's such a prevalent thing that I hear pretty consistently in the sector that I think demonstrates the extent to which the plantation metaphor is accurate in explaining the way that white power is able to use the sector to maintain control over black people. Um, so so the relationship to when Africa awakes, I'm hoping to have a similar impact um, with this piece. All right, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through each of the sections and just kind of give highlights of each of the sections and then just invite you all to discussion. Um, so the first one, white supremacy. If you're here, you probably understand a little something about the system of white supremacy. So I won't go into too much detail, but I'll spend time on two particular points. The first is it's important to, to recognize the impact of the invisibility of white supremacy. Because I think while one can develop an analysis, part of the way that white supremacy perpetuates itself is the way in which it's rendered invisible in popular spaces. And so it being rendered invisible, what it does is that it then de it makes it harder to render legitimate in mainstream spaces the critique of racism and white supremacy, right? And it, it has a certain concealing effect um, that makes it difficult to call it out. And it actually creates this dynamic where it requires a tremendous amount of analytical precision to be able to explain the way in which white supremacy is operating when this tactic of its invisibility is deployed. Um, and, and so that bleeds into the second highlight that I want to describe, which is that as a result of that level, level of analytical precision, in conjunction with the fact that there's again um, the sympathies that folks show for our community being weaponized against these critiques. What tends to happen is that those of us that talk about white supremacy as a system are often targeted within institutions. And in the paper, I give an example of a woman who was a teacher in New York City when they were doing um, diversity trainings and she called out, you know, they were okay with racism. But once you start talking about white supremacy, it implicated systems in ways that made um, the leadership of that, of that school district feel uncomfortable. Um, and so I think in addition to just generally understanding what white supremacy is, one of the ways that, it, that it's operationalized is that it characterizes those of us that militate against white supremacy as angry, um, as mean, um, as disruptive, um, in ways that allow people to deflect from the actual criticism. And LBS actually gets this a lot. And I mentioned that a little bit in the piece that there, and, and it particularly happens in like backroom spaces where you get people in meetings with philanthropy that'll tell people LBS doesn't work with white people or LBS hates white people. And a lot of times the people who are saying that know it, that it's not true, but they understand the powerful propaganda weapon it is against forcing people to confront the substance of the argument. And, and we very rarely get folks who oppose our position to in public raise a legitimate argument against what we've put forward. So this tactic of characterizing us as just angry or mean or hating white people is one of those diversionary tactics so that people don't have to confront the actual substance of the argument. So the section on, on black pathology. So in my preparation in writing this, I went back because I had seen the Boys of Baraka documentary before, but it was but this was probably like 10 years ago when I saw it. Um, and so I, I was like, you know, I need to go back and watch it just to get a sense of um, how accurate my, my remembering of it was. 
And so, so this is probably back in June or July when I went to watch it. And, I, and so I rewatched it again, and I was really disturbed. I was disturbed by the fact that it was so widely recognized and heralded. Um, you know, you had Martin O'Malley's wife um, do a screening at Charles Theater, um, kind of hailing this documentary as something that was revelatory. Um, and so when you actually watch it, I mean, and even from the very beginning, and I don't, I don't talk about this in the paper, but even, or maybe I did, but even in the very beginning, where it opens up and you have black kids in East Baltimore pretending to arrest each other and shoot at each other, and that's the, and you have the police helicopters kind of flying over in the night, like that's the way that it begins. And, and so even when it just started, I remember thinking to myself, this is probably going to be every bit as bad as I, as I remember it being. Um, and so a part of how something like that is possible, that a documentary that is so um, engulfed in notions of black people being pathological, is if people believe it. And so one of, the, one of the reasons why I made it a, a point to talk about the Boys of Baraka documentary is that it was so widely separated that at the very least, it affirmed core beliefs that folks in the sector have about black people. And in affirming those beliefs, then there's a certain impact that it has to affirm um, that level of, of patholo pathology. So, there's a quote in there from a graduate student from 1970 that talked about the way in which um, graduate students in particular are asked to do a whole bunch of research on black people. And they're told that they're doing a service to the community because they're doing these in-depth studies on what's wrong. And a part of what this graduate student says is that um, that actually helps to affirm the beliefs that people already have about black people, right? And I'm sure you've heard people um, I've, I've heard people say we don't need any more studies like black folks are subject to study after study after study after study and I think it's clear that the impact that that has isn't to make more um, visible the problems that face our community um, but in fact affirm notions of black inferiority and that's really where the notion of black pathology that's where it becomes most important to identify it in the sector what I mean by that is, is that in the collective American consciousness, most of us, many of us, have not, not encountered narratives of people of African descent operating in arenas marked as high levels of civilization. Um, matter of fact, a story I tell all the time about this. Um, I was a debate coach um, several years ago, worked with a gentleman uh, who was coaching a public high school um, and so, and at the time I had an analysis about racism and white supremacy. And so the brother says to me, you know, Africans were traveling the Atlantic before Europeans were. And so my first instinct was, you know, why do we always have to have these conspiracy theories? Like black people have to do stuff first. It makes it harder for people to listen to stuff that we say. And then a few months later, I encountered this YouTube video of a man named Ivan Van Sertima giving a lecture called They Came Before Columbus. And then I eventually read the book, They Came Before Columbus. And there were two conclusions I came to after reading that. The first was that not only were Africans traveling the Atlantic before Europeans, um, but Europeans were some of the only people in the world that thought the world was flat, that it was actually common knowledge to everybody else that the world was round and that they were navigating it. But the other conclusion that I came to is I had to ask myself the question, why was I so willing to be dismissive of the idea? And what I came to understand was that I had not encountered narratives of people of African descent op operating at levels like things like navigational expertise. And because I had not been exposed to those narratives and histories and images, it, it was difficult for me to believe that it was possible. And so one of the impacts of the prevalence of the notions of black pathology is that it shapes people's imagination in such a way where they can't imagine black folks being anything other than pathological. And so a part of what happens and a part of what the Boys of Baraka documentary does is that it reaffirms that very notion that in all of the images that you see, and particularly the way that it was shot, the documentary was shot in a way where that's what you come away with, is that there's so much wrong with the community. And it's interesting because there were a couple of things that I picked up on in the documentary that you can tell the, the, the folks shooting it weren't thinking about. 
For instance, there's a brother named Devon Brown, who's one of the folks that is in the documentary that went to the Baraka school. And when I saw his grandmother, I was like, he's going to be fine. Right. And I knew that because I'm clear about the way in which the black church, when folks are connected to it, there's a certain level of support you get from the community um, when you're when you're because a black church has a with all ever critiques or issues that folks have with the church it has provided a little a level of stability for our community. And so I saw that I was like, yeah, he's 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 going to be mostly fine. Right. And probably would have been fine regardless of the school. The other thing. Um, that I noticed, there was, and I talk about this in the paper, that scene where the boys in a circle. And the way that it was, it was shot in such a way where the boys in the circle communing with each other was shot as if it was an example of disruption, right? An example of their bad behavior. And for me, I felt like that was an opportunity to really show like they were able to build a community amongst themselves and commune under those kinds of circumstances. Um, and so for me, it, it just demonstrates the, the inability of folks who've only been exposed to notions of pathology to look at things that may be examples of strength in the community and not have the ability to see it. Um, and it plays itself out, um, particularly in the way that um, social workers and other professionals structure their programming. Um, so if you think of, if, if you only understand black folks as pathological, then you're going to structure services that is based more on managing dysfunction than actual empowerment. And, and that really, if you look at the notion of black pathology and its impact specifically on the nature of how services are delivered, you will find that many institutions, whether they will say it or not, are really in the business of managing suffering and don't really see it as possible to do anything different. <laughs> So that's why I go into the section of, on methodologies of liberation. Um, so because black pathology makes people see folks of African descent primarily through the lens of being a problem, there are ways in which the methodologies of service themselves perpetuate notions of white supremacy. And in the paper, in the section, I give three specific ways in which um, white, the methodologies in the human social service sector uh, perpetuate white supremacy. The first um, is to focus on, on the individual as separate from the larger community. Um, and so you see this, for instance, in the term like at risk youth, right? Where the goal of programs that usually talk about at risk youth is helping that individual young person, regardless of the condition of the larger community and the strengths of the larger community, right? And so it is only through kind of a European cultural lens that individuals even make sense outside of the collectives that they're a part of, right? What this means is that if you structure services based on helping that individual person, one of the impacts, and it goes back to this notion of black pathology, is that the community is understood to be an impediment to the young person as opposed to a part of which you're building on for the young person to survive and be self-sufficient. <laughs> The second is the commitment that there's such a thing as a methodology that's completely objective. So much of the way that these mainstream institutions justify their approaches is they describe them as scientific. And as we know, science historically has been used to justify power and domination, right? And so it is the, the veil of science. And in fact, Naeem Akbar, um, who I quote in this section, talks about something that's actually really intuitive when you think about it, which, mean, which is that the person doing the study will determine the scope of the study. Determining the scope of the study, study then determines the nature of the instruments used to do the study, which then will impact the outcomes of the study. But if the folks who are designing the scope of the study have a fundamental belief in notions of black inferiority and pathology, you will produce research that affirms the core beliefs set aside by those that are framing the scope of the investigation. So it's actually a pretty intuitive argument, but Akbar frames it in the context of the way in which people in the realm of social science actually end up producing outcomes that are predictable based on the institutions and individuals carrying out the study. Um, and so that's the danger. When you describe something as scientific in the way that it's done in the mainstream, 
it then puts someone in a position where they're having to challenge um, this notion of something being scientific um, in a way that if you don't have the same intellectual instruments, you're easily to, to marginalize. And I think part of the way this plays out is folks in the community will say, well, this doesn't work. And it allows a professional, a so-called practitioner who comes from that traditional school of thought to say, you're just not doing it right because this is scientific, right? What you're describing is an old wives tale or what you're describing is something that, you know, is spookism, right? And, and so that's part of the, you know, an example of what makes a, methodology white supremacy and then lastly on that is drawing uncritically from bodies of work rooted in white supremacy um, one example of that one term that you hear pretty consistently particularly in conversations about education is the achievement gap right and so it's an honest thought to think black folks and the metrics used to determine success are behind um, our white counterparts. But the logic of the achievement gap assumes the legitimacy of the metrics that are used to determine achievement. If we step outside of the metrics that are traditionally handed down for a second and just merely think about what it means for the underground economy and the networks and the science that it takes to operationalize those networks, right? That's a level of achievement in terms of using your intellect and operationalizing a system that folks create, right? Now, unfortunately, that's not something that you can take a test for, right? And so people who are highly functional and intelligent get deemed as less intelligent or not being academically successful because the things that are being measured actually don't match up to the actual social and cultural context that folks come from. And so when you, when you uncritically borrow from notions like the achievement gap, you are actually um, perpetuating the notion that the metrics being used are legitimate measures of intellect. And if those dominant institutions that are constructing these metrics, it deems them as the ones that are superior, right? Um, and so it has the impact of perpetuating this notion that black folks are inherently inferior. Um, so that's one way that it shows up. So in terms of thinking about methodologies of liberation, as I mentioned before, because of this notion of black pathology, people don't think that there's anything from black people to learn from. Because how could we learn something from a people who haven't accomplished anything and from a people who are primarily pathological? Um, and so it's important to understand how deeply rooted in the collective American consciousness these anti-African notions are. During the European Enlightenment, there was a discipline that emerged called Egyptology. It emerged for the purpose of theorizing Egypt out of Africa. So you think about the process of enslavement and the labor that was the basis for the development of America's global political economic empire. It needed a way in the, in the process of European domination of the world they needed a justification for dehumanizing Africans. And so a part of that justification was to say that if Africans have no history, then subjecting them to subhuman conditions is a sensible station in life for peoples of African descent. And so this notion of Egyptology, this idea that Africans could not possibly have developed, um, you know, or have not possibly participated in doing cesarean sections or building social democracies and building urban centers. In fact, um, I actually just came back from Jackson, Mississippi yesterday, and on the plane I was actually reading um, another Ivan Van Sertema book, um, Science in Ancient, African, in Ancient Africa, and um, one of the things that, an essay that's in there, is that there is a model of a small airplane glider right, 2,300 years ago. The Cairo Historical Museum put the remains that they found in the section for birds. And they put it in that section because for them it's like it's impossible that they would have done aerospace 2,300 years ago. And so it took um, an archeologist who happened to be looking and was like, that's obviously not a bird, right? But just the inability to believe that Africans could produce such high levels of technology, 
right? It's such a core part and it doesn't require any ill will. In fact, if you've never been exposed to these kinds of ideas and, and, and examples of African greatness, and you see mostly images of black pathology, the notion of white supremacy and black inferiority is a rational belief. And so a part of what happens is that, that it makes it, it, the box in your brain to think to yourself, let me figure out what black people were doing to solve this human problem does not make sense to you. Um, and so that's why understanding the way in which anti-African notions are embedded in our collective consciousness is so important because then there are methodologies that we could be drawing from that could help us address these problems that we just don't have a box in our brain to tell us to, to, to endeavor to do that. And in fact, um, in, Joanne, in Dr. Joanne and Elmer Martin's book, um, The Black Experience in Social Work, um, they actually talk about the challenge that confronted early social workers in the early 20th century. And they argue that throughout the 19th and early 20th century, um, black folks, particularly during the Great Migration, had developed um, the, what they call the black helping tradition. So dealing with trauma and grief um, and all the things that came with being black in America. And they argue that early social workers, instead of studying what black folks had done to deal with the issues and struggles that black folks had dealt with, they chose to embrace the kind of bourgeois ideals of the social work profession as the basis for their practice and study. And they argue that it is that decision as to why these industries have produced ineffectual tools for social change. That it's based so much on these distortions of black life um, that it makes sense that, for instance, the field of social work would be ill-equipped to have a transformation, transformational impact because it's based on folks who, again, did not study what black people had done to transform our own lives and our own condition. Um, and so one of, the example, and I give, one of the examples I give that I think is a very good one because it's controversial um, is Elijah Muhammad and the Nation of Islam. And I, and I give it as an example of human development, right? So, you know, so I'm not proselytizing or you know, asking, telling people they should join the Nation of Islam. I'm not saying that people should endorse their theology as their own. What I'm saying is when you look at the outcomes that it produced, right, and you see the theology of Elijah Muhammad as a theology that was constructed for the purpose of addressing the condition that black people were in, and you look at the impact that it had particularly on black men, the ability to take people who were engaged in petty criminal activity, right, people who were kind of perpetually incarcerated, and the way that it was able to produce people from a human development perspective, that we're able to be self-sufficient. And, that the, and, and what people harp on is this whole piece about the white man being the devil, right? And what's important to recognize about that part of the theology is there's actually a purpose for that. It wasn't just a thing to be said out of hatred or, or whatever. It was, the purpose was, because if you think about, there were a lot of black families that had a white Jesus in their, in their living rooms. So it made it difficult for black people to see white people as having done anything criminal to them, right? And it caused people to deify white people in ways that fundamentally caused them to not value and love themselves. So the idea of the white man is the devil was an attempt to use some extreme rhetoric for the purpose of allowing black people the space in their consciousness to affirm ourselves as, as deities, as worthy, in ways that that theology was uniquely positioned to do. And so just, and, and so when, when you read through um, many of the articles that have been written on human development, you don't see people at least study it, like at least read about what it did and its impact and think about how to emulate some of what it, what it was able to do in the models of human development that exist now. And I would argue that it's, it's again, the impact of notions of black inferiority, that black people, he was just this weird dude that had this weird religion, right? And, it, and so it makes it so that people aren't studying it, you see it as just some weird aberration, right? Um, and so there are lots of different methodologies that our peoples have produced throughout our history here that can serve as a resource for addressing 
a variety of different human problems. Um, but unless we disabuse ourselves of the notion of black inferiority, um, these methodologies will elude us because we won't think that they exist. Um, and then lastly, on the, on the methodology of liberation part, um, one of the things I discuss is this notion of incorporated resistance. So now it's actually cool to talk about structural racism, right? And people might even let you talk about white supremacy in a conversation. They might let you in a workshop and say some things that's hard for white people to hear. But a part of what happens is that, um, and Dr. Greg Carr, who's the chair of Afro-American Studies at Howard, um, in his lecture in 98 on the life of John Henry Clark, he describes incorporated resistance um, by saying, you can talk all that black stuff, just come to work tomorrow, right? So essentially, you're able to put out the rhetoric, but the institution itself remains intact. And the institutional arrangement that produces racism and white supremacy remains intact. So I use the example of Johns Hopkins School of Public Health, um, which has invited me, me on many occasions to say a lot of very similar things that I'm saying to you today, right? And some would use that as a justification for why they're different. But you still have the university that has not paid its debt to the fact that it's made billions of dollars off of the cells of Henrietta Lacks. It hasn't, you know, it, it gentrified East Baltimore, displaces so many black folks and has not paid for that. Um, and continues to benefit from being in Baltimore and it, the medical experimentation that it's done in the past. And so the institutional arrangement remains intact, right? And so sometimes people get confused that your ability to speak it, to say it in a meeting or at a panel, equates to actually changing the institutional arrangement. And white folks have gotten very sophisticated in incorporating black folks that are okay with just being invited to stuff and being able to talk very radical, as opposed to making demands on the actual institutional arrangement to change. So the last um, section, the confrontation piece, um, the confrontation, and so it's interesting because we actually talked about whether to call this section confrontation because of what I described at the very beginning. Like, you know, oh, here goes LBS being confrontational. And so as a result of that, that's why, that's why for me, the importance of the UNESCO conference in 1974 and Cairo is so important. Because at the UNESCO conference in 1974, there was a convening of Egyptologists all around the world. And two of those Egyptologists were Sheikh Anta Diop and Teofilo Obinga. And everybody who came to this conference knew that the purpose of it was to, um, for once and for all, settle the dispute as to what the racial designation of the ancient Egyptians were. And if you read the notes, if you read the minutes of the UNESCO 1974 conference, it is made clear that Diop and Obinga embarrass the other scholars who continue to make this argument the Egyptians were not African people, right? And it wasn't just the knowledge of history that allowed them to win this confrontation. Diop actually had a degree, a master's in um, physics. And so he actually helped to the, he used other sciences. He, used, he, he helped to develop the melanin dosage test, right, in order to help um, develop the age of the um, remains of the ancient Egyptians. So he used multidisciplinary sciences in beating back Egyptologists who, for the most part, were not scientists of any kind. And so it was as a result of that conference that even though you may still hear, hear people say it, in many even mainstream academic spaces, the notion of the ancient Egyptians not being African people is something that there's a lot of ammunition to fight back against. And that actually helped lay some of the foundation for African-centered scholarship um, to be more prevalent um, than it was prior to that. Um, and so for me, the importance of that conference is that's essentially what we're hoping to do with this, is to engage in a similar kind of confrontation with the institutions of the status quo, using rigorous study and analysis in order to fundamentally be able to walk away from the conversation with it being settled that, over, that white folks have failed in their endeavor to try to fix black people. You know, after um, the civil rights movement, um, there was a move away from institutions that socialized our people being led by black people 
to the human social service sector taking up the responsibilities that were once black people doing ourselves. And over the past 50 to 60 years, white folks, have, white folks and their institutions have demonstrated their impotence in their ability to produce outcomes. And in no other context would folks who have failed so abysmally at a thing would continue to be resourced and continue to be seen as thought leaders in an area where they fail so miserably. And one of the people that we name in the black paper is a gentleman named Bob Embry, um, who was the president of the Abel Foundation. Um, he's been around a very long time. He won a city council seat in the 1960s. Um, he then was asked by then Mayor Schaefer to work in the housing department. He then went on to work for the Carter administration as a deputy commissioner for housing. And then he came, he did a few things, came back to Baltimore and was, became the president. He thought about running for mayor in 87, decided against it, and then decided um, that he would run the Able Foundation. Um, and there are several books that I've read about Baltimore where there are people who asked, by, who asked the author not to be named in the quote that they give about their criticisms of Bob Embry because they perceive him to be that powerful. They perceive him and his ability to essentially isolate folks from the sector. Um, and I've heard people tell stories about the fact that he saw himself as this kingmaker that has that level of control over institutions that socialize black people. As a person who actually, at one point, he was the chair of the school board, the Baltimore City School Board. And he, and he has no formal or informal credentials to be an authority on the socialization of black people. He has a law degree from Harvard, right? And so that's as much as he knows about anything as it relates to our community, right? He, he is not, demi now he knows a lot about some of the data, the data that points to notions of pathology. So he may be able to tell you the unemployment rate, right? Or the number of vacant houses in Baltimore or you know, some of the data on public safety. But in terms of talking comprehensively about black people or history or culture or methodologies or institutions, he's not qualified to be in a position as a thought leader. And that's not being said for the purpose of not liking him personally. I don't know him very much personally. And in fact, I had a conversation with him in his office, I think it was either 2013 or 2014, where I raised some of these points and he was rather hospitable about it. We were clear that we didn't agree, right? And so this isn't out of any personal animus towards him as an individual. But it's like anything else. If you're not qualified to do it, it doesn't make sense for you to be in thought leadership. And it's not aggressive or mean or anything else to make that statement. And I would argue with the human social service sector, there are lots of people like Bob Embry who are in positions of thought leadership who are not qualified to be there and are never asked publicly to substantiate why they're qualified to be there. In fact, you have a lot of people in the human social service sector who are in positions of leadership who I would argue are not only not qualified, but I wouldn't want them anywhere near children, right? But they're allowed to be there because there are not mechanisms of public accountability such that they could be taken down, right? And, that, and so a part of where I end that um, with the paper um, is both the acknowledgement of the failure of the thought leadership that's currently in the status quo, <clears throat> but also about the importance of black people ourselves outside of the, the scope of the sector, developing who we want to designate as thought leaders in particular industries in the human social service sector so that the billions of resources that attract into that sector can be put to good use and can be put to helping to build solutions to our problems that are not mired in the notion of black folks having to be dependent on people outside of our community. And so the confrontation has to be such that we have to be able to put forward folks. And there are lots of people in our community who could serve as those thought leaders, but are just not given the opportunity to serve in those roles with the level of freedom necessary. And so we're actually gonna do, an LBS is gonna do an event in 2020. Um, we're gonna partner with uh, Shauna Murray Brown of Kendra Wellness and Jamie Wooten of Collectively. Um, and we're actually gonna host a conversation that's specifically for black people for the purpose of thinking about and answering this question
um, who are those who should be designated as thought leaders for black people in the human social service sector and begin to strategize about how we put them in place, how we replace Bob Embry um, and others like him with people who actually make sense to be those who have tremendous authority over where those dollars go. Um, so those are the highlights. So any, any questions, comments, thoughts? <laughs> Um, so, um, you're right, there, there is an emergence of things like social impact bonds, um, the idea of social, the double bottom line, you know, social good and profit, and the fact that they're not necessarily mutually exclusive, and so there's a greater interest in investing in social good from an entrepreneurial perspective. Um, there are two thoughts that I have about that that are related to what we talked about, what I've talked about tonight. The first is that it's important that we have an analysis of who is in position to curate which kinds of efforts are able to get access to the capital and to the platform. And one of the things that I argue here and elsewhere is that oftentimes in white audiences, even those that mean well, that the thing that is most legible to them from a financial, economic, social perspective are images of um, two things, either images of black pathology, so you're gonna help these poor kids that can't help themselves, or the spectacle, right? Um, so we actually saw a lot of that, like with the uh, uprisings around the country and you know, police-involved shootings. You have um, the, the focus on the spectacle of protest and um, as opposed to dealing with like the nuances and the structure and all that stuff. So I say that to say that on one hand, I think given the enormous amount of capital and where that capital is coming from, I think it's important that we don't take that on as a strategy that's gonna substantially shift power and resources. I think there are individual people that may be able to get relationships to get access to some of that capital. But for me, I don't think it should be something that becomes a strategy that we think will get us greater levels of capital. And then the other thing that I feel about that is a, a part of the issue with social impact See, I feel like black people as a subject matter are a thing that, pe black pe that people generally feel like they don't have to know anything to have an authoritative opinion on, right? Whereas with anything else, you would have to know something to talk about it. And so a part of my concern is with notions of social impact is that you have people who are really corporate folks who are in a position to be thinking about social good. Um, and I would argue that those who are immersed in our culture and traditions and literature um, would be suspicious of the way in which this kind of social impact industry is being rolled out because I think a part of what it does is it invites a bunch of people with opinions that don't know anything about our community um, to have a platform to really move stuff. And I think it's important as we see gentrification taking off around the country once it's taken off, it's real hard to pull back. And so for me, that's one of the things that I would be concerned about is once it becomes something that we endorse as a community, once it starts going in a direction that we don't want it to go in, I would be concerned about our inability to pull it back. 
other questions? How you doing? Brilliant, brilliant publication. Thank you. Credit to LBS for you all's analysis, but you know, in the private conversation that I had with you, the real challenge, in my opinion, 2019, is the confrontation on two levels. That's, that definitely needs to be a confrontation with the managers of white supremacists, no doubt. But there needs to be a confrontation with those of us who look like us. And I'm just not certain because I have been here before, and I don't mean to bring that to the forefront, but those of us who have lived long enough, we have heard this from Asa Gilead, from Ian Bobbert, all the brilliant people you quoted in your publication. Brilliant, and I thank you all for having the courage to bring forth a 2019 analysis, and, and a local analysis of what it has been in Baltimore, what I refer to as an air conditioned hell, that black folks have been living in. And there's ways that you can basically construct an air-conditioned hell to make it seem as though it's not air-conditioned and it's not hell. So here we are in 2019. This is my, my, my question is, um, basically, I would say my question is directed at the confrontation from the Fed. Mm -hmm. And I know you all want to do a, um, a session sometime 2020 that will bring black folks together to have that conversation. But to what end and how will we evidence that this time around that the confrontation has really taken place and that something more than just an ongoing analysis is going to be the end product? Mm -hmm. that's, that's one question. Mm -hmm. The other question that I have has to do with the quantification, quantification, quantification of the damage that white supremacy has had on the black community. Do it within a 10 year time frame, a 15 year time frame, what is the cost that entrenched poverty has had on the black community? Mm -hmm. What is the cost that incarcerated thousands of black men for tens of years over and over again? What is that cost to take men, black men in particular, out of the community for 10, 15, 20 years for petty crimes, some crimes, of course, serious crimes, but for petty crimes, and the loss of wages? And I'm not saying that you all should have to do that, but that should be provided. Mm -hmm. And maybe education institutions in the area might be able to assist in that effort, but would that provide a compelling argument this time around that something truly needs to happen in Baltimore City this time around that will move the needle and so that we are basically not having this discussion 10 or 20 years from now. Last point is how do we evidence all this? I don't know what the metrics will be this time around to see in five years, 10 years, that because of this publication, something significantly changed this time. So again, that we're not here talking about the same stuff mm -hmm. in 2040, 2030, because we did something today. And whatever I can do to support that effort, I am all in. And I hope you all know that. Yes, sir. And I praise you all for this work. Uh, and I hope that we will continue as a community, especially my community, to basically make something happen that has not happened in the past 30 years that I've been doing this work. Yes, sir. Um, so I'll take them in order. So, um, and you're right. Um, one of the things that we um, are very clear about is that we're not the first people to say the things we're saying. And a part of the extensive research that is in the paper is evidence of that. Um, and there's so much other stuff that I could have put in. It just, you know, didn't want to, you know, overdo it. Um, I mean, you can go back even as far as 1852, when Martin Delaney um, is criticizing the Liberator, which is the former formal organ of the abolitionist movement, for the fact that of all their offices around the country, they only had three black people employed. Right? It's 1852. Right? Um, so. For us, we don't, and in the publication, we don't see ourselves as saying anything that hasn't been said before, but applying it to the contemporary context. The thing that I think is different, and you know, we've been studying a lot for the purpose of becoming more clear of our analysis. What we think is different is that many of our elders and scholars have been making these arguments 
in the context of the industries that they work in. And, and there are certain limitations to that because one, if you're an education scholar and advocate, that should be what you do. But there's a political side to it. And unfortunately, given the relationship that black folks have with the class of elected officials, um, there hasn't been the ability to form a political thrust in terms of addressing these problems. And so a part of LBS being a think tank and a politi an explicitly political organization, we're LLC, right? So um, we have a lot of freedom in terms of what we're able to do and say, and we spend a lot of time um, in City Hall and in the legislature for the purpose of being able to use the levers of the legislature and to try to organize um, the political power that, is, that there's potential to have um, to try to make some of these things happen. So, so what we think is different, building on what has been done in the past, is LBS being an explicitly political organization, combining political power and using that as leverage to change these industries in ways that benefit our community. Unfortunately, when I, particularly when I think about the information that our black elected officials get from the institutions that they're, you know, who advocate for black people, and this is no disrespect necessarily to the organizations about the name, but like criminal justice, they're usually interfacing with the ACLU, right? If you're talking about children, it's usually advocates for children and youth, you know, or um, other, you know, and these are organizations that we've partnered with, right? But those are the kinds of institutions that elected officials are getting most of their information about our community from. Right. They're not necessarily getting it from the Asa Hilliards, the Naeem Akbars, um, because there, again, is not the political apparatus developed for the purpose of making that synergy. And in fact, it is our limited experience that when you go before black elected officials who I think in many cases, a lot, a lot of our people are confused and that includes elected officials. But when you put before them something different than what's been happening, they see it, particularly in their own self-interest, as being able to claim that they're doing something different. And so our hope, and again, this is, this is, what, this is what we think is different, and, and we work to try to get clear on our analysis, um, is that using politics to leverage these different industries, and even starting with the human social service sector, which is you know, unmistakably a sector that caters to black people, we think it, there's a very salient political argument to make to say that at the very least, black people should control it. Now, in terms of how we do it, I think that's where the internal conversation comes from. And that's, it bleeds into your second question, which is, you know, in this convening that we, that I discussed earlier, you know, how to make sure, because there are, and I mentioned this in the paper, there are black people that internalize white supremacy, racism, black inferiority, and do things that perpetuate racism and white supremacy. Um, and I think we have the benefit of the time to observe the ways in which, you know, Hilliard and Dr. Martin and others to observe how their approaches and methodologies are more effective than those that are provided by our white counterparts. So I think we just have the benefit of time that allows us to be more precise in our conversations with each other about which methodologies are acceptable and effective in our community. Um, because I think, particularly in, my, in, in reading some of the debates that were had um, about what the best way forward is, I, I'll give an example that actually came across recently. There's a sister named Mo, Monet Ming Francis. She wrote an article about movement capture, this notion she calls movement capture. And she, she essentially studied the minutes of the board meetings of the NAACP in the 1920s, 30s, and 40s. And what she, what she figured out is that because in the early 1900s, the NAACP was doing advocacy on anti-lynching. And then there was a shift to doing work on education desegregation work. And so she was trying to figure out where that shift happened. The shift happened as a result, it was a, it was a person on their board who was a, um, official at a major foundation, and there was a major grant that they received, and the condition for receiving the grant was to pivot from the anti-lynching work and to focus on desegregation, right? And so having enough time passed to be able to look back 
at some of those formations because I think there's still some of our people that'll say things like, you know, we can't totally, you know, have independence. We got to include them in some way, shape or form. And I think there's enough evidence over the past 50 to 60 years and beyond to, to suggest that we need autonomous institutions and we need methodologies that aren't rooted in the methodologies of the status quo. Um, and so that's gonna be a big part of how we even frame the conversation and discussion, is to say that we have to come with information about the nature of our methodologies and bring forth evidence of the efficacy of those particular methodologies. And as I ended my talk, one of the things that I, that I think is important to say repeatedly is that those methodologies produced by white institutions are an abysmal failure. Like they're not even like a little bit wrong, right? They're, they're an abysmal failure. And when you study the things that black folks have done in spite of the challenges, that the evidence is that those methodologies are more effective. And so we hope that in that convening, in that conversation, that'll be the basis by which um, we hold each other accountable to say you need to come with evidence as to how this has been effective for black people. And we just believe the evidence will bear itself out. And then the last thing, the question about the metrics for the impact of this publication, um, that, that I, I hadn't thought, I, we haven't thought about that comprehensively. And a part of actually we were interested in is folks feedback about how to track and measure that. Like we were actually kind of surprised that so many people had already read the report um, and we're interested in dialogue about it. Um, we just kind of figured it would be a part of our 2020 promotion plan. And the fact that so many people came and have showed interest, um, we're really interested in people helping us determine what are the ways that we should um, decide how the impact is measured. understand this, I kind of want to get it out. I actually look forward to um, a deeper conversation about um, solutions. Um, but what I'll say is that I work um, uh, for city government now. Um, I've worked for nonprofits pretty much my whole um, career, a um, few states outside of it. But um, what I have experienced personally, what I've seen happen with a lot of my colleagues um, in the space is um, that it's, it's very risky um, to try to address you know, some of the things that we can see like very clearly when you're on the ground doing the work. And I can appreciate the need to have formed an LLC to be able to speak boldly you know, the way that you do about these issues um, what I've read in, um, in the paper and what I heard you say um, tonight um, is that one of the ways that you're looking at a solution is to pay the people who are currently in power with other people who would have a better, um, would be in a better position to, to serve the community successfully. Um, and I want to just kind of put forth the idea of um, sort of this, as you rightly call it, this non-profit industrial complex and all of the things that support it and keep it intact um, and how, it's, how it creates this risk um, for people who might even be in positions of power. Um, and you know you sit at those tables and you you know sort of try to push you know for change and, and challenge. I think a part of it is like how do you do that you know in a way that um, reduces the risk that you have um, and also you know sort of challenging all these small key policies and decisions that are being made every day that um, perpetuate the disparities like you know self interest. The, the way, the way success is measured in nonprofits, I think a lot of ways undermine, you know, efforts to reduce disparities. Um, and so that is so pervasive mm -hmm. um, in the industry. And so I'd be interested in having more conversation around how even as you get people in power, you know, who can, you know, be better positioned to do this work, how, how you deal with, 
sort of the pervasiveness of you know white supremacy in this industry and um, protect those people you know in those positions from retaliation um, in all the different ways that it is possible to be retaliated against um, and bringing people from within the sector um, I know I personally wanted a space like this to be able to strategize and to talk about you know what I experienced and what so many of my colleagues experienced. Um, so I like I just like to put that forward mm -hmm. and have reactions to yep. that. Like I definitely love to hear what you have to say. Yep. I want to put that forward to the call. Yep. So just two quick things. One is that we intend on the event that I mentioned earlier to be a space for that. Um, and it, for us, we see the work as being a part of an ecosystem. And I think it's important that we begin to see ourselves in, in being parts of an ecosystem where you may not be the person to say the thing. Right. Maybe you say to us, hey, this thing is happening. Go look over here. We need you to make a big deal about it, um, because that means then the folks who you're. Um, who you work for may then have to come to you and say, what do we do? Right. And so kind of playing that inside outside game in a way that's really accountable um, to a larger ecosystem of, of, of people. And I think and we've successfully built a lot of those relationships in certain contexts where we've been able to provide that cover. I mean, I mean, we've literally had folks who people tried to fire and we've you know used kind of our platform and ability to push back against that. And so. Um, I think that's something that as a community, um, and, I, and I think a part of what makes it difficult sometimes is people's willingness to be honest about the fact that that's the position they're in. You know, we understand that people have bills to pay and everyone can't afford to be in a position where their livelihood's at stake. Um, and so again, that's why for us it's important that we see this as a larger ecosystem um, and that we're clear about identifying whose role is what, right? And so it's not everybody's role to do what LBS does. Right. It's not everybody's role to be um, the people that are driving education policy and, and running the institutions like different people have different roles. Um, and so we think it's important to be able to support each other, um, which includes being able to help provide um, mechanisms for protecting people's livelihoods. <coughs> Thank you. And last time, this was where it's done. It's work. Thank you. Um, I think it would be helpful to add to what you're doing explicit case studies of what visible failure looks like in terms of the elements and the outcome of this visible failure. So people can see. What of what? I didn't hear that. Of what? Oh, it's feedback. Can you hear me now? Yeah, I hear you. I think it'd be helpful to add into your work some case studies that explicitly break down the elements of abysmal failures. The abysmal failure, got it. Got cause and effect. Right. Including using real world so people can see it and see themselves where they are in it. Mm -hmm. um, similar to what this brother said over here, um, a lot of what you want to is almost out of autobiographical to myself to what I've been through as a pro black person all of my career and all of the sabotage and blah blah blah. But what also needs to be part of the work is you, you reference Sodoma and you reference Nia Magbar and work that's in some instances up to 20, 30 years old. Um, and I knew I know knew and knew, knew some of these people. Things are different now in that the normalization of internalized oppression or anti-blackness is a normal part of the culture, including black culture. Mm -hmm. um, black people, you said in your comments something along the lines of, there are some black people, and I'm paraphrasing, mm -hmm. there are some black people who are, who are anti-black. Being, not being anti-black is the unusual way of being in this society. I'm talking, I'm talking about black people now. I'm not talking mm -hmm. about mm -hmm. white folks, mm -hmm. poor just white folks. I'm talking about black people who have been in an anti-black acculturation for generations mm -hmm. who live and breathe mm -hmm. who are anti-black and who sabotage pro-black possibilities because they have been trained to have an anti-black impulse mm -hmm. and they're not conscious of it. Mm -hmm. That phenomenon has to be explicitly 
broken down as well mm -hmm. because a lot of progressive intentionalities relapse back into white supremacist codependency mm -hmm. inadvertently because people don't know how to walk outside of white supremacy. That's right. They don't know nothing about it. Mm -hmm. So we have to not assume, and I'm not saying we assume this, that people, regardless of where they are in stature, from the president of the United States to the homeless, understands the bizarre concept of black affirmation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So all the stuff I'm saying is that, in my opinion, for your work to go to the next level, as a, um, in addition to challenging systems, is there needs to be an educational component where people can recognize themselves mm -hmm. and get self evaluative revelation. Because mm -hmm. anti blackness is the norm. Absolutely. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and, and the only thing I would say to that is, is that um, there's lots of work, you know, of course, yourself and many others um, that have been able to provide language for the way, the specific ways in which um, notions of anti-blackness show up, both in terms of people's behavior, people's worldview um, and their and the institutions that they're a part of. And I think that that is a set of work that I think is important particularly as it relates to certain industries and certain endeavors. And the reason I say that is because, like, to your point, there's so much of our consciousness that's rooted in it that I think it's everybody's kind of personal responsibility to do the study and work to, like, disabuse yourself of it. And then when I think about, like, the short term, like people who, you know, maybe they, you know, just finished graduate school, they're about to jump into their profession and then some somewhere along the line they, they it hits them right but they're in the world right now like working with young people or working with folks in our community um i think and it's and it's and this is kind of beyond our particular capacity but in terms of wanting to work with other people and thinking about in particular industries or particular areas of work how do we build and create literature for people who are in those lines of work that may not fully grasp it yet, but have a at least like some kind of toolkit that will help them in their endeavor to be to get as deep as they need to go. Um, and again, that's one of those things that's beyond our individual capacity, but we'll certainly be willing to work with folks in building something like that. Good evening. Good evening. Absolutely. 
is that we got to have an economic partnership, an African American, and a political um, mm -hmm. partnership. Because if we don't have that, it's like, you know, right now we have all these people running for mayor. Mm -hmm. As a collective per people, African American, we need to have just narrow it down after we hear everybody. Who, and then we decide, I mean, that's where I grew up with in the 60s and 70s, you know, where we had Little Willie on the west side, we had Pete Burns on the east side, and we had somebody else in Northwest Baltimore, I think it was Clarence, um, excuse me, Clarence Lamp. And, you know, they got together and with our parents and stuff, and they decided who they want in office. Mm -hmm. We got away from them. Mm -hmm. And the same thing with when we talk about the nonprofit and people saying that, you know, because of their job, they can't really say anything. And when they see stuff, back in the day when my ancestors came up, they didn't care about losing jobs, and they made less than what we are making today. They was willing to achieve. So sometimes we have to get ourselves out of the way and say, is it worth it to sacrifice my people, or is it worth me not being there on that job? And that's when you create your own job. And sometimes we have to do that. And I always say this, and you probably heard you on the radio, I say if we, if the black men would do, come in the community and control their own community, we don't have to have the police control in our community. And you look at it because they are taking all the funds from everything else. That's why we don't have heat in the schools because we're giving everything to public safety. Have we got any better? We have three, but 314 as of today in murders. Can you imagine if the black men, back in the day, even before all of this, we got over 200, it would have made it much easier. And we wouldn't be suffering the way we're suffering. And the mamas, we have to do the same thing. We have to give control to the men and a work beside them. And in everything that we do, even with the nonprofit, we got to make sure that our children, our families, our whole, just not the children. We gotta make sure that parents, because they go back to their home. I don't care what, how we work with them in the communities, in those centers and stuff. If we're not reaching the whole family, we don't have lost it. We haven't even done our work. Mm -hmm. We just spinning the wheel, and then another new nonprofit coming to Baltimore, same thing. And then we wonder why we got all the murder in the street, all the blood in the street, because we are not doing our job mm -hmm. as African American people. We have to. Assimilate amongst ourselves, and then come out in the open. Mm -hmm. Yep, and I think w one of the couple things I want to say about that I think are important. Um, the first is that our decision to focus on the human social service sector was thinking about what chunk, both of resources and control, can we address, right? Because we know we can't, you know, we can't do it all, right? right? As you know, so it's like what chunk. What sector? And the reason that we picked that particular sector is because it's the sector that primarily serves our community in real direct ways, right? Um, and then the other reason was because um, over the past 50 years, there was a time where human social service sector, um, the, the, the budgets were minuscule and there, weren't, there wasn't a whole lot of money there. Whereas now it's mushroomed to billions of dollars that go into the sector. Combine that with the fact that, and I think the question of making money is a question that has been convoluted for a bunch of reasons. Um, and so I think the question of how, as black people, do we develop economic self-sufficiency? Part of the problem is, is that very few of us have ever experienced it or done it in our current contemporary context. And those, and many of those who have, have been able to do it for themselves as individuals, right? And so as a result, I think a part of the problem then comes in is that in terms of how do we build that kind of economic base that, allow, that would allow us to be independent, for me, this sector is one piece of the solution to that problem, which is how do we redirect billions of dollars that otherwise go to people who suck at what they do, and invest it in some of those brothers you're talking about, right? So those brothers can make a living patrolling their community in ways that's much more humane and accountable to the community. So it's a part of why we focus on that particular sector. And there are other, whether we're talking about community economic development, 
right? Public safety, like they're all different industries where a similar analysis could be done. Um, but again, we chose to focus on this sector because for us, we see it as low hanging fruit. We see it as a particular industry. And, if you, and for folks who are in it, whether you're at a lot of the meetings or convenings, they're at a place where the evidence of their abysmal failure is so evident um, that we, can, we see it as low hanging fruit to begin to divert some of those resources. And we hope that by doing it with this particular industry, that it can be transferable to others. I just want to say something, two things, actually, quickly, and going back to your talk about the business failure. And I have been doing research for years, um, and I actually have researched internationally as well. In fact, I just got to Baltimore, so I can't speak so much about Baltimore. But what I'm beginning to realize, and ask, actually, is, is the point for it to be a business failure? Mm-hmm. I mean, there, and it just doesn't apply to the struggles of African American populations. You know, as I, one thing I've noticed mostly about Baltimore are homelessness. Sometimes they think it fix these problems, but I just sometimes think that they, they don't want to. So, it, and it, it, is, it goes across with the environment with a lot of different things. Um, and I really can't remember, oh, I know what I want to say. Um, in the case of African Americans, isn't it always the case that African Americans have done it for themselves? If you look at the people say that Lincoln was the great emancipator, but in reality, it's African Americans who freed themselves, mm-hmm. pulled themselves through Reconstruction, led the civil rights, and whatever movement we look at, it's been African Americans who've organized and done it themselves. And I think that is what you're doing. You're continuing that fight of mm-hmm. doing it yourself because they're not going to solve their problems. I don't, no problem. I, I don't think they want to. Right. I, I don't think that's the plan, and that's after doing years of research and. You know, keep talking about the same thing, and 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 fr- some friends of mine were talking about this, and I just don't think we just don't think it's in their mm-hmm. plan to help. Let's say disenfranchised populations. Right. Disenfranchised populations mean that other populations are right. enfranchised, mm-hmm. and and if you don't have disenfranchised populations, then you're not going to have that enfranchised population. Absolutely, and and the political aspect, and it goes to what the Baba earlier mentioned about this being a part of the plan. The political dimension to it is that those who are in positions of thought leadership in public would never admit that. And it is that that gives them the cover to continue to operate these institutions. I I, I believe, now I've not been there, but I believe that amongst themselves, they're they're very clear that they don't have any intention on the conditions changing very much, if at all, right? But in public, they have all different kinds of faces they put on to say they do that, and unfortunately, not enough people understand that they don't mean it. And so I think a part of the political dimension to it is to be able to build enough of a political thrust to put them in a position to have to answer for all they've done and either force them to say that they never meant to do it or force them in a position where they're defending the abysmal failure. In both cases, I think it puts us in a position to begin the process of putting folks and positioning them in the industry in such a way, positioning different people in such a way to direct these resources to stuff um, that'll actually have an impact. Hi, uh, I'm Lawrence Mary Jane, director of research. Um, two quick points because I want to demonstrate what we're hoping part of this talk is to do is show you examples of how we can actually make these arguments, and then they want to have a question for you. So first, the abysmal failure. I believe you can show it with contemporary evidence, but you need to prevent them from blaming black people for that failure and actually blame them. So one strong example of this is drug treatment. Many of you would be surprised to know that what's seen as best practices now, not quite the one in the 12th century, was invented by a white man in the 30s and has no strong empirical evidence base behind that works. What it actually has done to a lot of people is it's focused on basically, you know, internalizing your sense of hopelessness. It's very detrimental for a lot of black men. But it's still seen as a best practice. So when people drop out of 12-step, they're saying, well, they weren't ready for treatment. They weren't, they hadn't hit bottom yet. When it's really the Eurocentric framework of 12-step, which will lead them to failure, and sometimes we need to play over and die. So that's a very concrete, strong failure of a dominant best practice, but they're blaming the black 
right? So along those lines, second, you can prove the value of a culturally competent framework. Um, but unfortunately, it is a little bit hard. Ideally, we have HBCUs that can help us do all this research, but because of their limitations on funding and internalized anti blackness, it's not always there. But again, the strong example of what they said say the nation of Islam. The best science right now is that though we've been taught to think of addiction as strictly a brain disease, it's in many ways the disease of human disconnection. So having a strong social network is really important to recovery, which is why I always said it's so terrible. It tells you to leave all your old friends behind if they use drugs. Conversely, when you think about the nation of Islam, and it says that the black people around you, but nine lot more explained part of Elijah Muhammad's, Elijah Muhammad's epistemology is when we are typically taught to think of spirituality as the metaphysical, like we embrace our powerlessness to that which is above. Elijah Muhammad said, no, you are God, and made it real and material. So when you have that metaphysical shift within black people, they speak to connect to each other more. They call each other God. So they see the dog within each other, which leads to increased social connection, which the best science we have right now tells us one of the best ways to fight addiction. So when we talk about the nation of Islam being people off of drugs, that's not some ethereal pie in the sky. It's actually best backed up by the best science we have right now. But they won't go to the nation of Islam. They'll invent something new that claims to connect people to the black community so that they have to connect to each other. Right, so we have to prevent them from reinventing the wheel. We have to tell them we have our own wheel and we're going to beat you with it, which is fun to so us. Like, you know, which is leads to my question. That's why I'm partially I'm so concerned about this 2020 election and the way that people are being seduced by the idea of what we really need is more funding. The biggest thing that they can always do is say, yeah, it's failed, but they didn't give it enough money. And even though it's talking about operations, leading people to be seduced by the idea, that we just gave this stuff more money to work. And part of my concern is that smart people are being seduced by that because they falsely believe, well, if I get the money, I can shift it to a different framework. When they actually get back the opposite way around, I fear. That once you start pumping money into this beast, you aren't going to be able to stop the momentum and change the pedagogy and practice because it'll be too lucrative. So, I mean, again, like, what can you do when someone is seduced by the idea that if you just had more money, in the current structure. So um, there are two things I would say to that. The first is that the argument that you described that people make, like if we just had more money, things would be different, has been the argument made for the past 50 years. So whether it's education, nonprofit, social service, like that's the argument that continues to be made. And the evidence, as you say, continues to demonstrate it doesn't work. The second thing that I want to say to that and I think it, it and this is an important point conceptually, which is that the, the institutional arrangement is just as important as what you invest in it. And what I mean by that is, is that unfortunately, a part of what we internalize in American culture is a very exploitative relationship to human beings. Right. And so what that means is that people are only valuable to the extent that they serve your own individual self-interest. And when you structure institutions that way, then the very nature of those institutions will be exploitative to the population um, that they're supposed to serve. So, for instance, when you think about most nonprofit organizations, the people who work for them are actually they're not accountable to the community. They're accountable to a board of directors, a board of directors that is normally squarely placed in the corporate sector. And so we have to build institutional arrangements that facilitate collective decision making and accountability so that those investments are not investments in individual gatekeepers or investments in people that are curated by white institutions as our leaders, but create institutional formations that facilitate collective decision making and collective empowerment. And so this was actually a debate that happened, particularly in the late 60s, um, when Nixon I'm um, essentially trying to appropriate black power to talk about black capitalism and empowering a few individual black millionaires, right? And so, you know, the point that Lawrence makes about this idea of giving money being a good thing by itself, part of the problem is, and actually, if you study the Kerner Commission, the Baba mentioned earlier, when they did from 1968 to 1988, 
one of the things that they found was that the black middle class increased about 15 to 20 percent but the masses but everyone else um, of black folks were poorer in 1988 than in 1968. so that there is evidence that just adding money to the community only helps a select few but actually does a disadvantage to the masses of black folks. And so, I, so it's important that we think creatively about how to structure institutions differently um, so that we're not just doing black versions of what white people do, right? But we're building institutions that are actually modeled after frameworks and cultures um, that, are different from, um, that are different from the ones that exist in our current society. And, and I guess the other thing I'll say to that, because I think it's really important, I have not seen a lot of studies, particularly in mainstream circles, of folks that have studied human organization or social organization, particularly in ancient African civilizations, and particularly in black formations outside of the gaze of, of Western civilization. What I mean by that is when you think about, for instance, studying um, ancient forms of governance, like we have this false belief that democracy is a recent invention, right? And, and so there's this narrative that America was kind of the birthplace of this idea of democracy being practiced and they were escaping these monarchies um, and that that was the nature of how governance existed in the past. And in fact, when you study um, the Nile Valley civilizations and aspects of uh, Central African and West African civilizations, you see, form, you see very complex and very effective forms of human organization that are different than the ones that exist here. In fact, one of the things I've been actually reading about over the past month or so, the so-called founding fathers, supposedly out of this kind of divine ordinance, developed this um, constitution that had mechanisms of democracy the world had never seen. Now, it actually doesn't make sense to believe that folks that escaped these monarchies would out of the sky be able to develop these notions of, of democracy. And in fact, um, there's a book, um, it's a gentleman, Bruce Elliott Johnson, in the 80s and 90s, who actually wrote about how the so-called founding fathers studied the Iroquois Confederacy and was the basis for how they constructed the American Constitution, right? So, and that, that actually makes more sense. It makes more sense that they watched other people who did it, as opposed to it just randomly was a divine thing that they came to out of the sky. Um, and so when we think about like how to structure organizations and institutions that are more collective, the Iroquois Confederacy was an example of a society where there was collective decision making um, that shared power. Um, and so those, so we have to invest in those kinds of institutions that share power and that are collective um, and as opposed to just adding money um, because like I mentioned before, just adding money can actually make the problem worse. Peace, bro. I struggled with grabbing this mic because uh, my personal belief is that you don't organize with white folks in the room. And you also don't organize without addressing black, anti-black impulses. Um, hello. Yeah. Um, with that in mind, when we're talking about whiteness, we're, ta we're talking about people who have adopted a schizophrenia about the importance in the world. And when you start looking looking at the past, all of the uprisings and the, uh, the bombings, the killings that happened time and time again, we're talking about the exact moment when black people are redirecting resources to their communities. Mm -hmm. And to that effort, what protections um, are we thinking about even as we endeavor into <laughs> to this particular market? Because mm -hmm. when you say confrontation, mm -hmm. we're talking about you know, when I think about confrontation, I think about individuals who have agreed to come to the table to work some things out, whatever else, even if they can't agree on anything else. But we're talking about a system that is uh, very comfortable with ignoring mm -hmm. everything that you bring to the table. And once you do bring it to the table, they can just dismiss the whole table, the house that you're in, and everything else. So there has to be a collective protection for us. And I'm just wondering about what are we, what are we thinking about in that aspect? So, so your, your, your preface to the question, I think, was really important and valuable because a part of the thought behind the convening that I talked about was for the purpose of having um, some aspects of that conversation in that space. And our, uh, there are certainly certain things that we should not say 
like on the internet, in the presence of white folks, you know, in terms of what those specific mechanisms are. Um, the way that I will respond, kind of the only specific way that I will respond to that is to say that it is important for black people to understand that you will be attacked if you are making the kinds of arguments we're making in mainstream spaces. And it is why it's important to build as a collective. I think part of the, the mistake that has been made is that individual people with knowledge feel like it's enough for them as individuals to go in and try to fight the system. And it's just important and imperative that we understand that we have to collectively do it because the attacks are so dead, the attacks are so strong and powerful. Um, Right. I think there are a whole lot. Yeah, I think there are a whole lot more of us that aren't scared, that just haven't been able to make enough time to be around each other and develop these, this collective plan. Um, and those who are scared, there's certain there's a certain level of conversation that they shouldn't be privy to. Um, but yeah, I actually and I work with a lot of people that I know aren't scared. You know, they just they just work a lot. They're carrying so much stuff. Um, because of all the other folks that are. Um, and I think it's important also to think about um, shared risk and, and distributing it in ways that's actually sustainable. You know what I mean? Because one of the things that I think is important, both in studying Malcolm, like one of the things that a lot of folks don't know about Malcolm is that the organization of Afro-American Unity was the above ground organization. But you also had a below ground organization that did a bunch of stuff that he didn't talk publicly about. Um, and it was smart and wise for him to be doing both of those, but having different layers of who was involved in what conversation. Yeah, a couple more, and we'll close out. Thanks, Marcy. You were talking earlier about the abysmal thing, mm -hmm. and, I, and I wasn't quite sure I, I thought you were talk, I thought the discussion was on the abysmal failure of the economic uh, uplifting of poor black and poor people. Am I correct? So I'm talking about the abysmal failure of white, inst primarily white institutions who claim that their mission is to help poor black people, okay. that they have failed. And the reason that that argument's important is because very rarely in mainstream circles, is the notion of them failing ascribed to them. So I just think it's important that the notion that white folks have demonstrated their, Im their impotence and their ability to transform these conditions so that it helps to take down some of the arrogance that many of them are able to move around the world with as experts on how to address our condition. Okay, I think, personally, I think the abysmal failure is the failure of capitalist economics mm -hmm. on our people and that we need to understand how to implement more cooperative. We've been talking about the collective energy. Mm -hmm. We've got to find out how to incorporate more collective economic endeavors with progressive minded people in our community. Right, absolutely. And, and whoever else is as progressive. Right. But the, the fundamental problem with America is this economics on us. Mm -hmm. You were talking about uh, the Able Foundation, and it reminded me of a Gold Center mm -hmm. Foundation yep. project and a book called Baltimore and Bound. Mm -hmm. And it talks about the economic loose that's been kept on black people that's in right. the country. And I think fundamentally since slavery in this city, I'm sorry, as well as the country. Absolutely. But I, I think that we need to actually give more consideration to what are the economic contradictions mm -hmm. that we've got to get around and make some of the things that we're doing work. Right, absolutely. And we want to do. Yep. And, thank, and, and thank you for that. Again, I think, and I, I agree with that 100%, a part of why, again, we focus on the human social service sector is because it's a particular place of intervention. And just knowing that in terms of bringing some of our people along, like, I just feel like there's some of our people um, that are not at a place where the conversations about the fundamental problem of America, white supremacists, you know, patriarchal society, imperialism, 
that there's people just some folks just aren't ready for that part of it. But if we can demonstrate in their particular line of work how those dynamics operate, I think it helps us build the bridge for them to come to that conclusion, which is kind of the overall system being problematic. Because I think a part of what we a part of what folks struggle with, like I'm from Baltimore, graduated from Forest Park High School. I went to Towson University and some of the black people that I encountered, a lot of the stuff that we would say, like created an identity quake for a lot of them because they were socialized. And, and when they look at the kind of immediate world that they live in, you know, capitalism, white supremacy, all that stuff works for them. Right. And so a part of the struggle is how do you get them to recognize something that all the incentives are in the other direction? So a part of why, again, we focus on this particular sector is, for the, is particularly for folks who like that, that come out of school and they go in to the sector and then they see all this stuff that goes against the, the, the beliefs that they thought govern society. A part of what we're trying to do is capture some of them and say, here's some language that explains what you're seeing. And the hope is that they'll read some of the stuff that's cited here and go back and reach some of those fundamental conclusions. Thanks for your talk, Dave. I hear you describing how we have flawed institutions implementing flawed methodologies, and I hear you calling for more participation by black people in leadership roles. And I wanted to ask, uh, at what level are we talking? Are you thinking, does it help to have more black people running something like the Safe and Sound Center? Would that change things? Or are you thinking at the level of the ABLE Foundation or United Way? Uh, higher levels of involvement, because I'd hate to think uh, you were setting someone up for failure if you put more black people in right. charge of things that are running a flawed methodology right. and they're trying to operate a framework. Or do you think we just need different institutions and different approaches completely? Uh, and so what's your short-term and your long-term strategies there? So, um, so actually two things I want to say to that. The first is that for us, it's important that when we talk about the importance of like black leadership, we're not talking just about black, just a black person in a position of leadership, right? Because that's actually been part of the problem is that black people who are socialized with white supremacist methodologies, operating institutions that they have been trained to think work. And so it's important. And so that's why I put at the end of the paper, the importance of black folks coming together outside of the scope of the sector to develop what our plan would be for how we endeavor on displacing the current thought leadership. So in terms of like some of the specifics to your question, like I can't stand here and say, well, this is what black people are gonna do because I think there's the work of black folks coming together and then after we come together, being able to put a plan out there and say, this is what we're gonna do. Um, but a part of the point that I make is that there are very powerful gatekeeping positions um, that we need to have some level of influence over such that at the very least it stops being in our way and at best can help to support, to, to, to supplement the things that we organize to do on our own. So, so I, you know, you mentioned, uh, someone mentioned earlier like the ABLE Foundation, for example, right? We have to ask ourselves the question, what role should they play, if any, right? Um, how would that institution, need, how would we manage our relationship to that institution? Um, and so it may not be that we say we want a person to lead it that's our person, right? Maybe we say it's fine how it is, but there's certain concessions that we ask the institution to make. Um, but the specifics of it are, are very complicated. Um, and again, it would take a collective effort amongst black folks to figure out what that plan would be and then present it to the larger public. Peace, everybody. Uh, my name's Brother Changa. It's good to be here. But I was listening on Facebook. So I uh, raise your hand if you don't know what to do. Like you personally don't know exactly what it is that you just be honest for a second. You don't know exactly what to do about all that. Okay, good. So um, you know, I, I think it's beautiful that a group like LBS would uh, you know be put in a position from high school to even start to imagine and think that they could affect Baltimore by doing this work, right? And that actually has a bunch of layers to it that you would probably should research and figure out and figure out how you could reproduce those conditions for as many young brown people around you as you possibly can 
And that's something that you can do. Um, this, I'm keying in on this word that he used, oh, identity quick, right? And, you know, I teach white people and, and brown white people all the time uh, about whiteness. And I watch identity quick come up in people's eyes all the time. And, you know, you shouldn't be dirty in, in, in feeling that, right? But it's mainly because you weren't introduced to concepts and you didn't go and read. So, you know, my charge in these kinds of rooms is always about two things. Number one, how in your work or in your day-to-day -day work are you uh, informing yourself, right, by talking to whoever you're around that's, you know, that are in these constituencies that you hope that you can affect or help, right? How are you talking to them? How are you informing yourself? What research are you doing, right? Because they can't do it all. That's one. Number two, uh, you know, especially for my brown folk in the room that are doing good work, and then my uh, so-called white people who are, are trying to do the best work they can. Uh, you know, we talked, we had this conversation, I said I was listening on Facebook, we, this, this conversation about money comes in often. It's not about having money, it's about what money. Where does that money come from and what comes with it? And so I'm always asking people, especially in the epicenter of black discretionary capital, I'm always asking, what part of your work and your fundraising is to create that trust that will allow those dollars to flow to you so that you can use them unabashedly for these pro-black causes? So those are my, those are my two issues. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Jenga. So we're going to close down right now. We're at 8 o'clock. Let's give Dave another uh, round of applause. For, uh, Papers are actually available at the table. Uh, like we said, we are asking for a donation, but if you don't, if you have a small donation to give, or you know you don't have it tonight, you can take a book with you. It's not like you can't take if you don't give money. But we're just trying to make sure we print them. Uh, we print more of these so we can send Bob Bimbery his own copy in the mail, and make sure the all, all the other white folks that we're talking about uh, who need to see this see it, and other black people who are in the sector can actually use it as a weapon uh, to transform the sector. So I appreciate you for coming tonight. Uh, support LBS, hope you come out uh, during Annapolis during the legislative session, and also on Saturday at Pleasant Hope Baptist Church from 11 a.m. to 3 p.m. We have our sixth annual Black Legislative Agenda Day. It's free. Uh, we're gonna have a couple of panels talking about education and criminal justice, and I believe uh, Diamante Brown, uh, who is the recently minted president of the Baltimore Teachers Union, actually is coming to talk about the Criminal Commission education funding, so you won't want to miss it. Uh, Pleasant Hope Baptist Church, 6 p.m., uh, 11 a.m. on Saturday. So again, thank you for coming, and have a dope night. Peace.